What is up heroes, this is Midnight Zero, and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton and the Curious Village Blind. In the last episode, we, well, I'll let the game do the talking. Having finally returned to Reinhold Manor with Claudia in tow. Okay, this is the same old uh, scene. Basically, we're looking for Raymond as uh, he pertains to Simon's murder, potentially. And so we've been looking around throughout St. Mystere, chatting with people trying to see where he's going. We chatted with Jarvis, I believe, and we're about to come over this way, uh, head over towards the park. I'm trying to remember exactly the names of all the people, but yeah, there's that ominous tower in the background. There are a whole bunch of mysteries that are going on right now. We can see some of them here. Uh, there was the abductions. That was the big thing. People going missing. And wow, there's still still quite a few mysteries to go. But, but <laughs> honestly, I don't know how long this game is, and don't tell me. I don't like having that expectation as to you know when the ending is coming or whatnot. Uh, but I'd imagine we're moving through it pretty quickly and I don't know did we check everything that was in this area I don't think we actually went in the restaurant and saw if there were any puzzles for us to do in here I know last episode might have been a little bit boring because we didn't progress the story that much and spent a lot of time going backwards and doing a lot of puzzles with characters or in locations um, that we spent a lot of time with in the past but I hope you guys well I mean those of you that like Layton like it for the puzzles and the characters and aesthetic but at the very least primarily for the puzzles Anyways, Flick is saying, hey, I'm sorry I don't have a puzzle for you now. I'll have one for you next time we bump into each other. Okay, how about, was it Crouton? That's who we were looking for anyways in this region, right? Raymond, he hasn't been around today. Sigh. It looks like we've hit another dead end. Too bad you couldn't find him. He usually skips out of work and comes here to gossip and have coffee. And you know, speaking of gossip, I've heard some weird rumors from my customers lately. Recently, there's been talk of some strange old man running around St. Mysterio kidnapping people. Add that to the abductions pile. A kidnapper? Who is this old man? I heard all this secondhand, so you got me there. You need to find a better source for village gossip. You might want to try your luck at the cafe. Usually you'll hear rumors straight from the source there. It's almost sunset now, so the cafe should be open for dinner. A mysterious old man kidnapping village folk? Now that's a rumor. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And quite the impactful one. Oh, so that's the end of chapter three. Wow, I, I wish I went to the park and searched around there um, before finishing up the chapter, but puzzle sent. Wow, so we already missed, we missed four of them. Milk pitchers, three umbrellas, the camera and case, stamp stumper. Where would I have found those? Hmm, interesting. We'll have to give them a go. Professor, it's getting dark out. I'm afraid that's my cue to start closing up shop. Come by tomorrow if you get hungry. Sounds like a good plan. Ooh, and we're treated to a lovely animation. As the sun sets and the darkness takes this curious village of St. Mystere, and the looming tower looks over on all of the night's happenings, <laughs> whatever it may be. Luke, let's take a moment to sum up our findings. We have a strange roaring tower disappearing villagers, and an odd elderly kidnapper. It's all so bizarre. I can't make any sense of it at all, at all, Professor. I think we've finally got some clues on our hands, my boy. Observing the nightlife in this village might tell us more of what we need to know. Great idea, Professor. Night falls. It's turned dark and Raymond still hasn't returned. Continue the investigation to find clues. Sure, we'll save. I mean, why not, I guess, right? Ooh, and we're treated to a little bit of different music. How nice is that? Okay, let's head over towards the park. Um, I want to see what's going on over here, if there are any more puzzles. What kind of love? Just throws garbage wherever he pleases. What do you have to say to us, Deke? Excuse me, so sorry to bother you again. Have you seen Raymond since we spoke last? Oh. Come, Luke. Let's go. Just gonna fall asleep there, or what? <laughs> Just not feeling very talkative. It opens at 10 and closes at 5. Okay. It's a Ferris wheel back there. I should have come earlier. Regardless, we'll, we'll chat with whoever we find along the way, I guess. Sorry, young lady. Could you help us? We're looking for someone, you see. And... Sorry, can't help you. And by can't, I mean don't want to. <laughs> I've barely even talked to Raymond, and I am so not interested in this search. 
Hee hee hee. But maybe if you help me solve this puzzle, I just might, you know, remember something. Of course. Also, what's interesting, I don't think we mentioned Raymond. Did we mention Raymond? And just who do you think you are, young lady? <laughs> That's funny. So we got ourselves our, our first puzzle of the episode. Puzzled aliens. Interesting. But yeah, I don't think we mentioned Raymond. That's awfully suspicious. <clears throat> Anyways. From high in the sky, a pair of aliens observes humans using a bizarre object. Perplexed, one alien turns to the other and says, How strange. The Earthling is opening a hole in a sheet of paper and marking it with a line to show the other Earthlings where the hole is. I've never seen anything like it. What could these extraterrestrial visitors be talking about? Okay, so it's a, it's a very, I don't know, just straight up riddle, right? The Earthling is opening a hole in a sheet of paper and marking it with a line to show the other Earthlings where the hole is. Hmm. A hole in a sheet of paper. What could they be talking about? I mean, I'm thinking maybe like a map? They're using an object. There's nothing that jumps out immediately. <laughs> um, hmm. What type of paper is opening a hole in a sheet of paper? And marking it with a line to show where the hole is. Huh. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, guys. <clears throat> this might be one of those that we come back to at another time, but... There's, this isn't something I can really... I don't know, grasp onto and try to deduce, really. <laughs> or at least that I can think of. No great strategy, per se. That comes to mind. It's just one of those, you kind of sit there and, and think about it until, uh, in the words of Jimmy Neutron, you have a brain blast and it, it arrives. A bizarre object. Maybe a map, but what does it mean to open a hole in a sheet of paper? Right, I'm trying to think if you had like some sort of, some piece of paper, and marking it with a line. How do you open a hole in a piece of paper? That's, that's part of what's interesting to me, right? Because if you took like a 2D plane, right? Like, like a flat piece of paper and you said there was a hole in it and you opened that hole, that isn't something I ever see really happening. But, but if there was something made out of paper, like, like an envelope, for example, that's something I could see you actually opening Right? So that's where my thought process is now. Is what types of non-flat sheet, I guess. Um, what kind of paper objects are there like that? And I'm thinking maybe like, like an origami box of some sort. 
but you would never do that. What's really funny too is that once I hear the object, it's gonna make a hundred percent sense. <laughs> you know, it's gonna be one of those things where it's like, oh, of course it's that, but, but I don't know. I mean, trying to work backwards, right? So we're marking it with a line to show other Earthlings where the hole is, right? So the end goal is to to take a piece of paper, open a hole, and then mark it with a line to show other people where that hole is. And I'm trying to think, what would what type of paper would you open a hole in and do that with the intent of showing someone else, right? Like, what would be the purpose of showing other Earthlings where that hole is? Like, what what type of piece of paper with a hole in it? Like, how do you interact with that? And it's a sheet of paper. So it's not like you open a hole and mark it with a line so that somebody can, like, fix it up or something, right? I mean, if it were like a sheet of cloth, you know, they wouldn't use that. But, but that would maybe be what I'm thinking of. Interestingly enough, yeah, I was going to say, how do they want us to input things? Yeah, so it's, it's definitely they want us to spell something out. Which makes it quite difficult. Yeah, I can't, I can't think of it, guys. One other quick thing, too, is that I'm not sure if they want us to, like, what do they want us to answer with, right? It's an object, right? They're using a bizarre object. And are they using the bizarre object to open a hole in a sheet of paper and mark it with a line to show the other earthlings where the hole is? Or is the bizarre object the thing that they're opening a hole in um, and thus marking and in, in that sort of thing? Or are they using this bizarre object in an activity related to what they describe in this um, these few sentences? That's a little bit unclear. I bet I'll have a better idea once I figure out what they're talking about in the first place. Um, but that will obviously influence how I choose my answer, right? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not thinking of anything off the top of my head, guys. I'm thinking maybe something that you would want to like look through, but yeah, there's, there's nothing that comes to mind immediately, so this will probably be one that I have to come back to later. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, obviously on like a sort of trust system, I'll think on this in my free time, <laughs> and if anything, um, if anything starts to come to mind or if I have some sort of idea, I'll eventually come back to this. I mean, I'm a completionist, so there's no way I'll go without solving this, but, but right now, I mean, I want to I play Leighton and... This, very much like a crossword puzzle, if you don't think up what, if you don't like start along whatever, you know, line of thought the, the game wants you to or the puzzle wants you to, there's nothing you can really do to push yourself any closer, right? Um, I, I can't think of a set of strategies I can start to employ to get closer to figuring out what this is. Um, so I kind of just need to think about a lot of different ideas and see if any start to match up with what they're talking about. Or maybe I'll interact with such an object during my everyday life and be like, oh my goodness, that's it. So I'll, I'll think on this more in my own time. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, don't think, I don't think if I sit here for another 15 minutes, I'll figure it out. And I definitely don't want to sit here forever wanting to play Layton and just end up thinking about puzzled aliens. <laughs> Way to think it out, Gramps. Looks like the gears need a little oiling, huh? Darn. So we could potentially figure something out if we if we chat with her 
Unfortunately, we're not going to have that option. I mean, obviously, they're also hint coins. Um, I do want to give myself more time to think about it before resorting to hint coins. So we'll, we'll come back. It may be necessary to do that. It also may not. Let's see if there are any other puzzles of relevance. Most things seem to close at 5 p.m. And who are you? Gerard. Oh, goodness, whatever shall I do? What seems to be the trouble, sir? Let's see here. Strong, young, and you look like you have a good back. Oh, thank heavens you came along. I beg your pardon? I've searched everywhere and I just can't find the thing. Oh, I suppose I must have dropped it when I was out strolling by the park this afternoon. I would go search for it myself, but it's gotten dark out. It is awfully scary out there. Bah, nothing of the sort. It's just that, well, I'm no spring chicken anymore and my eyes aren't as sharp as they used to be. So how about it, Sonny? Will you help out an old man to go search in front of the park for me? I mean, what? We're in the middle of our investigation right now. Now, now, Luke, no need to be rude. After all, the park is but a small ways away. And who knows, we might actually find some new information to hit our case there. Besides, helping those in need is the duty of any gentleman. <laughs> Splendid. Sometimes, I will say though, it is worth prioritizing who you're helping based on need, right? <laughs> I'll wait right here for you to come back. I'm counting on you. One more detail, please, sir. What exactly did you drop? Drop? I. Oh my, now what was it? Um, oh, that's right, it was my watch. Actually, my best wristwatch. Bring it back for me, Sonny. That was kind of suspicious, wasn't it? And it seems we can't progress forward uh, towards the cafe until we do this. I do want to check out Granny R's place and try some of these puzzles. We obviously have quite a few of them here. Milk pitchers. Something unfortunate now that I realize is that because we're doing the puzzles this way, and potentially an incentive to try to find them on their own, is that you don't get the dialogue associated with them, whether that's the funny descriptions or the person you chat with, um, that sort of thing. But regardless, now we've got a 50 picarat problem um, with more of these, oh, it's more of the pitchers, right? So on the counter, we have a 10 quart pitcher full of milk, an empty seven quart pitcher, and an empty three quart pitcher. The pitchers are unmarked and your task is to divide the 10 quarts of milk so that both the 10 quart and the seven quart pitcher are each holding exactly five quarts. All right. So, I mean, we'll pretty much go about a very similar strategy to before as trying to create unique combinations of, um, of numbers. <laughs> so in this case, we'll need to do this. Um, and after that, what will we want to do? We'll want to do something like this. That way. That way. <laughs> that way. <laughs> hmm. So if I pour the three into the six, I'll have nine. I can pour that into the seven quart glass. That will give six there, so then I'll have three, six, and three. Or no, three, six, and zero. Right? Wait, no, that doesn't make sense. Um, so if I pour the three into the current six, I'll have nine there, and I'll have one down there. I could pour six in, meaning I'll have three and seven, which is not a, a good state. That's just the starting state. So that's not the correct solution, or the correct move to make at this point. And I believe we just took the four that was in the seven quart jar and put it in the three quart jar. So putting the three quart back there is not the solution as well. So we have to, well, cause then we end up with a seven and three again. So I'm pretty sure we've already messed this up to some degree. Um, I don't remember what our most recent move was. I think we had six and four. Um, what I could do what I could do that would change things up is pour the three into the six and then pour the one into the three and then pour the nine into here and have the seven, the two, and the one. I could pour the seven into the three and I'll be set. There we go. Well, Whew. yes. 
I think what's proving to be a really helpful logical strategy for that is to think about what move you just made, and then obviously whatever you do next, you can't just undo that because that wouldn't be productive. And then also thinking about it in terms of like states, right? So I mentioned earlier that the first move you make will put you in a 7-3 state. Um, and so any move that puts you back in a 7-3 state is probably not going to be one that'll take you towards the solution. So thinking one or two steps ahead in terms of getting or avoiding 7-3 states, or like 3-4-3 three, three states, for example, um, is is a good way to at least start going down the right track. Um, I think maybe, hopefully that's helpful for some of you. <laughs> and we got ourselves another gizmo. Awesome. Now let's try 42, 43, 44. Interesting. So I, I'd imagine these were all by the park and that's where we potentially miss them or something like that because 42, 43, 44, we missed all of them, right? And that makes me think we just missed a certain section of the of the town that we didn't see, right? Anyways, another 50 pick around puzzle. While walking through a market on vacation, you notice a small stand selling cameras. A camera and case set is selling for $310. The seller tells you that the camera costs $300 more than the case itself, and that the case costs the price of the set minus the cost of the camera. So wouldn't it be 305 and five? You decide you'd rather wait on buying a camera and opt to just buy the case alone. You hand the seller a $100 bill and see his eyes light up. Light up. Think fast now. How much change should you be getting back? Should be 95 bucks. I, I think. I, that was only based off the first equation, really. The seller tells you that the camera costs 300 more than the case itself, and that the case costs the price of the set minus the cost of the camera. Okay, so that's basically to say its own price, right? The camera costs $300 more than the case itself. So 300 and five, and then and five, and then five. The camera costs $300 more. So the camera is 305, the case is five, and that the case costs the price of the set, which is 310, minus the cost of the camera, which is 305. Okay, so that doesn't change anything. So the price of the case itself should be $5. We hand a $100 bill. We should be getting $95 back in change. And I feel pretty good about that one. Um, I mean, it, so if you wanted to do this in a more, um, I guess, reliable way, uh, the algebra is that you have um, the cost of the camera, we could call X and the case is Y, and you have X plus Y equals 310, and then you have X equals 300 plus Y, and then you could do a little bit of a substitution. You have 300 plus Y plus Y, is equal to 310, you subtract by 300 on both sides and you get y plus y is equal to 10. Um, simplify a little bit, uh, you add the y's together, you get 2y is equal to 10, divide by 2 on both sides and you get y is equal to 5. Um, so that's kind of like the algebra of it, but this is also a somewhat classic problem. And the tempting answer um, is always, actually, you know, I should check to make sure my answer is correct before I go through all of this again, like the, what's it called? Um, the, uh, the racehorse problem. <laughs> But the tempting answer is to say, oh, $300 and $10. But then they're obviously $290 apart. Not, you know, the camera being $300 more. So, yeah. Good thinking. <laughs> that merchant had an awfully misleading way of explaining things, didn't he? Make sure you don't get duped by some swindler next time you go out shopping. Yeah, we'll, we'll do our best. Thanks. Thanks, Professor Layton in the Curious Village. Looking out for his players. Okay, next up is three umbrellas. 20 picarats. Okay, so they're ending the 50 picarats streak. <laughs> Three identical looking umbrellas are sitting upright in a stand. Assuming the owners don't check their umbrellas labels, what percentage chance is there, chance is there that only two people will walk off with their own umbrella? So, really quickly, I just want to think about if there's any tricky terminology here. What percentage percentage chance is there that only two people will walk off with their own umbrella okay and each of them does own an umbrella okay so i don't think there's any wordplay going on here it is really just a probability problem so let's think about it each, there are three umbrellas and each person has one umbrella what is the chance that only two people will walk off with their own umbrella? 
Ah, oh, they had to choose two people. That makes it a little bit complicated. So not three. And not one. So the way I think about it is um, we could either look for the, you know, the probability that two people choose their umbrella correctly. Oh, I wonder how... How in depth are they going to go with this? Because this could get, I mean, not super complicated, but certainly beyond elementary probability. And this is what, 20 picarats? Or is there wordplay? When they say their own, with their own umbrella. With their own umbrella. Does that mean the umbrella that they purchased or own? Or that they actually have one. Because in one sense you could say, the chance that only two people will walk off, well each of them will have their own umbrella when they're walking away, no matter whether or not, whether or not it was the first, you know, the one they purchased, right? Um, because there are three of them, and there, or there are three umbrellas and there are three girls, right? And so each of them will walk off with their own umbrella, so the chance that only two people will walk off is zero. That's one way to think about it. And honestly, given that it's 20 Picarats, <laughs> I think that's gonna be the answer they, they want. Because otherwise, I mean, you could think about it in terms of like a, like a slot problem, where if you have three slots for three umbrellas, and the first person choosing their umbrella has a one in three chance of picking their umbrella, and then the second person has a one in two chance of picking their umbrella. And then the last, well, even then, it depends. It's conditional. It depends on whether or not the first person picks the second picker's umbrella. Yeah, I, I think I think they're gonna go for a wordplay. I think that's what they're going for here, because otherwise... Or... Or do we even know that they choose them in an order, right? Are they just picking... They each pick one and then, you know, they're all choosing from the same pool of three? Or is it one person picks it and then the next person picks from the remaining two and the last person, you know, picks one, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm going to, I'm going to try zero. I'm going to try zero because I think they're going to go for the wordplay here. Because I don't think it's as simple as saying, okay, there's a one in three chance this person has their umbrella. There's a one in three chance this person has their umbrella and there's a two in three chance this person does not have their umbrella. And then you multiply them together and you get two out of 27. I don't think that's what they're going for. And especially in terms of like percentage, um, that would be kind of, well, that would be complicated to, uh, to express. <laughs> so, so I think I'm going to try zero actually. I'm going to try this. That should do it. That's it. Wow, I'm so glad I didn't overcomplicate that. <laughs> wow, that, that had a lot of potential to get pretty crazy, depending on how they picked the umbrellas and, uh, and everything. If two people manage to grab their own umbrellas, the third person is left with only one umbrella to take. Her own. It's impossible for only two of the three to pick up their own umbrellas. You know what's funny? <laughs> Is that I misinterpreted the puzzle completely. <laughs> the solution, if two people manage to grab their own umbrellas, so it's not even, <laughs> it's not even, I, I misinterpreted how they said if two, what is the chance that only two people pick up their umbrellas? So, working under the assumption that two people pick their umbrellas, 
the third person has to. So it's either only one person picks their umbrella. So they did mean that, like, when they said their own umbrella, they meant the umbrella that that person purchased, not even just, like, wordplay. It's, uh, <laughs> they did mean that. But it's a totally different thought process where you say, oh, is it even possible to have two people, right? Um, no, because if two people have their own, then naturally the third person also has their own umbrella. And it's only possible if, you know, one person doesn't have their umbrella. Um... <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. How interesting. How interesting. So we've obtained a blue bed. I think it's most fitting to go for Luke, given his blue text box. We'll take a look eventually at their housing places. <laughs> but for the time being, um, we're going to keep solving puzzles. Stamp Stumper. Did I not click? Oh, I clicked OK. I was, I was subtly programmed to pick the blue option because I was talking about blue. And we've got another 50 Picarets. Wow. Wow, okay. Your friend just got back from the post office where she purchased a, a sheet of stamps with values ranging from 10 cents to a dollar. Okay. First, your friend cut out the one dollar stamp and set it aside. Then she divided the remaining stamps into seven uniquely shaped bunches, each with a total value of a dollar. Can you divide the sheet of stamps the same way your friend did? Wow, so seven of them, right? with a total value of a dollar. So we're gonna have seven individual blocks that add up to a dollar, and what are our answer choices, right? There are no 40 cents, or no, there's one 40 cent. So there are multiple tens, plenty of 20s, one 40, plenty of 30s, 150, 160, 170, 180, 190. And I think that's pretty telling. There's 190, 180, 160, 170, 150, 140. And that's that's six there already. We will probably want to group them in some sort of manner so that of those 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, um, there's only one of those in each block. And I think that will ensure that each way we divide this will actually get the sum up to a dollar. Otherwise, if it's made primarily of 10s and 20s, we would have to um, we would have to do too much. We would need too many stamps to really get up to a dollar. So what I'd like to start with is look at the 40 in the lower right corner. What's worth noting is that, I mean, when we make a shape, right, it has to be we have to have a continuous segment of of stamps. Meaning, from the 40, we're moving to either a 50 or a 60 state. Um, we get the 50 by moving to the 10, or 60 by going to the 20. Because it's the unique option, let's look in the 60 route. If we go the 60 route, we can take one of those 30s and then the 10 to get to 100. I think we should try to stay as separate as possible. Hmm. However, if we go that route, we then look back at the lower right corner and we see, okay, we have a 90 and a 70 there. They, by definition, require very few stamps, right? The 90 can only take one of the 10s. And we have to ask ourselves, which of those 10s is more likely to be necessarily used by other blocks, other ways we divide up this segment, right? Um, oh, that's how they want us to do that. Okay. Um, and so, can we even utilize all of those stamps in the lower right corner if we follow the 40-20 route? And the answer is no, because 90 can use up that 10 immediately adjacent to the 40 on the left side, and then the 70 can't use that 30 and 10 in the lower right corner. And I'd imagine if we were to look at all of these, um, we need to utilize every single stamp available. So by that logic, we know that 40 can't go the 20 route and instead must go with one of the 10s available. Then we say, okay, which one? 
and the end answer is gonna be that it doesn't matter because <laughs> no matter which route you go um, you can't go towards the 90 and you can't go towards the 70 the only potential other option is that you go 40 and then you have like two of the 10s and then the 30 next to the 20 and then continue going that route to the 10 on the left but that just carves up the board in such a way that you don't end up utilizing the 30 in the lower right corner so i think our first shape we can say with confidence is um is that lower right shape there that adds up to a dollar and again this is the only way to utilize that 30 and that 10 in the lower right corner and then like we mentioned earlier the 90 has a lot of restrictions it can only use a 10 so we have to have it blocked off like that and then similarly the 70 has a lot of restrictions right it can only use a 20 and a 10 or a 30 and when you look at the stamps in its proximity the only combination that leads to exactly 30 is that um and then and then we're in trouble because 80 is not going to work <clears throat> great <laughs> great so we'll clear this for now um however i think this is actually a great starting point in terms of logic or is it because the 80 and the 70 seem to be at odds with each other right The 80 could use the 20, but if I use the 20 there, right? So if I block it off like this, what happens to the 70? The 70 gets screwed over. <laughs> it has no viable solution, so that can't be the case. And then that means the only way we can block off the 80 is that way. So we know that. I feel comfortable with that. Now let's look at the 70. The only way we can make the 70 work is with this 20 and this 10. There's no other way for that to equal exactly one dollar. And now the 90 could still go either way, right? However, let's say if 90 were to move to the right and we use the 10 on the right side, where would that leave us? We would still be okay. We could use 30, 10, 40, and 20 in that lower right corner, and we'd be okay. If we go up, though, then what happens? We use that 90 and that 10. Now, the question would be, does that 10 to the right of 90 ever get used if the 90 itself doesn't use it? And I think the answer is no, because it can't be used with the 40. And... If we use it with everything around it that's not the 40, for example, in column four, if we were to use um, 20, 30, 10, 30, 10, then the 40, 20, and 10 on the right side are isolated and add up to 70 and can't be used. So I think what that means is this 90 has to utilize the 10 um, to the right of it. So we can confidently say this. Because again, if we use if we were to go north of 90, above 90, then that 10 to the right never gets utilized. So now we can use the 40, right? Because we have this 30, we have 10, and then um, we have the 40 and the 20 here, and that's the only way that that will work. And now we have the 60 and the 50 remaining. I should also note, we're still making unique shapes, right? And we've made one, two, three, four. So we need to make three more shapes, one presumably involving 60 and one presumably involving 50. And uh, let's see here. Just by visual inspection, I think I've got it, um, rather than having to go through an entire logical process. I think that's our answer. Although it says seven unique shapes, right? Yeah, uniquely shaped bunches. And I think I just recreated um, a shape 
Yeah, I did because on the le lower left we have a three straight block and then the 205030 is also a three straight block. Ah, so I'm going to have to clear this. Um, just going to really quickly revisualize where everything was. So it was like this, and then this, and then... Or, no, it was the other way around. It was like this, and then like that. Okay, so this is where we were. So what I had outlined before would add up appropriately. But, like I said, it, it doesn't meet the unique shape um, condition. So, there is one other thing. Let me, let me check to make sure we haven't done that already. No, we haven't. Okay. Then here is the solution. So, just to check. Um, you can, you can, what I guess internally was working through was with the 50 where could you go um, and you could go in a lot of directions but it would utilize too many blocks <laughs> I thought and um, and similarly with the 60 you don't want to get into the 30s and same with the 50s otherwise you're not going to utilize those tens on the you know the top right and top left and I think we have unique shapes I think so and they should all add, or add up to a hundred so I think we're in the clear. Cool, we'll submit that and see how it goes. That should do it. Awesome. That was a that was a tough one, but that was a cool one. The key to I mean, you guys have probably already started to learn, you know, what types of puzzles I like and dislike. But for me, this is something really interesting where you can really think through from the beginning to end with logic, right? You can look at this and you can deduce, okay, based on this, this has to be this and this. And then if we do that, then this, right? It's not it's not sort of, I guess, by chance, the idea hits you in the head um, the right way. But anyway, so, so that was um, all of those puzzles. Now, because, I mean, I'm looking at my timer, right, to see how long I've been recording. And it's been quite a bit. However, I know I'm inevitably going to cut a few minutes out where I was just quiet in that first uh, puzzle with the aliens. Why, howdy. Do you often find yourself hopelessly achingly puzzling? Okay. Um, thanks, Granny Arm. Um, but it, we probably, because I took so long with that part and have a few minutes that I'm going to cut out where I was just silent, um... Could probably continue going for a little bit and again i hope you guys enjoy these episodes even if they are primarily just puzzles and not so much story advancement um i do want to play as many of the puzzles as i can so that is going to be a priority of mine uh we can't go in the town hall um gerard wanted us to go to the park to help us to help look for things however we're going to continue hunting for puzzles can we go in the inn we can hello there boys turning in for the night already not yet i'm afraid we're still out surveying the town by the way have you seen raymond around today Raymond, that skinny man with the big purple lips? No, he hasn't come by today. But you know, for all his fancy clothing, I hear he's actually quite the layabout. He's probably off idling at the cafe. Why don't I go check for him there? I see. If that's the case, I'd like to go to the cafe right away. Do you mind keeping the front door open a little longer? Oh, don't you worry, Professor. Another guest arrived to stay the night, and I'm setting up his room. Besides, my door is always open for a dashing gentleman such as yourself. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay check over there interesting I clicked on the sign for the inn oh look professor I found a hidden puzzle <laughs> there it is I never thought to actually look at the sign the pet hotel number 113 I like that number a town not far away from your home recently opened a ritzy hotel for pets can you guess what kind of animal is currently relaxing in room 97 move two matches to form the answer on the screen below Can you guess what kind of animal is currently relaxing in room 097? Move two matches to form the answer on the screen below. So I think <clears throat> I think the intention here <laughs> is that we're supposed to deduce from <clears throat> the number arrangement 097 um, what type of animal it is. 
And I don't know if we're supposed to make a picture of it or if we're supposed to spell it. I don't really know. Although, now I, I, I think we spell it because I'm trying to think, you know, you think of common pet animals. And also, reasonably, if these were letters, what could they be, right? So on the left, we could have an O, we could have a B, we could have a D. However, in the middle, we have quite a few interesting things. We could have potentially an R or an A. And then on the right, we could have maybe, maybe like a, like a lowercase G, maybe? No? Um, but a T, really. And you guys can probably already see where I'm going, but if we move this match over here, and then this match over here, and of course, rotate it, we have a cat. <laughs> um, now the only hope is, I think these are in the right spot. Can I just like shuffle these around a little bit? Yeah, I think, I think they'll give us credit for that. And I think that's what they want us to do. We'll give it a go. I can't think of anything else, um, any picture I could draw with the matches, but in ter but I came up with something to spell, so... <laughs> Alright, we got it correct. Awesome. Good job, Luke, you solved it. Very nice. Ah, uh, to be a pampered pet. <laughs> that cat looks a little devious. That was a cinch. The pet hotel. Awesome. Okay. So, I guess what we can do is keep, um... I guess we'll move back here. What happens if we go over this way? What's going on in this part of the town? There's no way we can show our faces in the manor until we find some sort of clue. We must continue to investigate. I couldn't agree more, Professor. Ah, so that's the game's way of telling us, no, you're actually not going to be going over there. This young lady and her puzzle with those puzzled aliens and the paper. Wow, oh, there's still nothing that sticks out. Yeah, there's still nothing that sticks out. <laughs> so, we've got to go to the park. Um, so we'll head over in that direction and see what's going on there. Deke is, is still there. What happens if we talk to you now? Yawn. Hmm? Gerard lost something again. I think he's getting kind of slow. He's always dropping stuff. So, what did he drop this time? Let me guess, was it a wristwatch? Hmm? <laughs> Indeed, he did drop a wristwatch. Did you pick it up around here? Yep. Well, actually, no, because Beatrice was actually the one to find it. Thing is, it was already late when she found it, so she decided to hold on to it until morning. Go to the inn, and you can probably ask her for it. <laughs> so there you go. Now that I've got your attention, could you give me a hand and solve this here puzzle? Dark places give me the willies. But I wanted to solve this puzzle so bad, I came out here for help. The puzzle is all about stars, see? Maybe you can make sense of the thing. Hmm? Of course, I'd be happy to help you with it. That's too funny. It's like, now that I've got your attention, please help me with this puzzle. It's uh, it's really troubling me, and I went all the way out into the dark, the big scary dark, <laughs> um, to get some help. Legend has it that people used to stare up at the heavens and find images of animals or important events in the constellations. Looking up at the star-filled star sky here, try to connect the five largest objects in space to form the largest five-pointed star possible. Connect stars by drawing a line between them. Make sure that your line doesn't pass through another star along the way. So, so we need to make a five-pointed star. And we need to make the largest one possible, right? Part of the Difficulties the the instructions tried to connect the five largest objects in space To form the largest five pointed star possible, so I think What they want is I mean There's this star up here this one this one and this one all of which stand out as being you know particularly large, right? Largest five pointed star possible so, could I do something like this? I could, okay. Now, part of the difficulty is figuring out, I'm looking at this and I can potentially see, you know, five of the arms of the star, right? 
What if I were to continue along maybe this way, and then up here... Ooh, does that count as going through that star? It totally does. It totally does. And that, of course, is going to be problematic. Hmm. Oh, so that's how I get rid of them. Interesting. So what if I were to go this way then? And then up to here. Oh, did you see that? Did you see how the line just barely shifted out of the way? That's pretty funny. Now we can probably go around on this side. We can. So we are currently at potentially like two and a half points, I guess. However, I don't think this is going to be sustainable. <laughs> because um, I don't have anything to go out further with. So that's not going to work. Try to connect the five largest objects in space to form the largest five-pointed star possible. Connect stars by drawing a line between them. Make sure that your line doesn't pass through. So we're trying to make a large star here. Can we do something like this? It's like one point of the star. It's a really fat star, but you know. Something like this. Because <laughs> that would be one, two, three, and then four and five. Um, these guys would have to connect to the same one. Could do something like that. That is technically a five-pointed star. It's um, it's pretty far from pretty. <laughs> it has five distinct pointed ends. Granted, I mean it would look a lot nicer if the slopes of those lines uh, brought you know those those bend points too closer to the center of the star, but but I think that counts. And again, we are connecting the five largest stars, I believe. So, and I think this is the largest, we're trying to make the largest five-pointed star possible. I guess, oh, you know what then, would it be too, <laughs> part of what's tough is like, I think I could technically do this. And that is technically still a five-pointed star. It still has two different, you know, slopes going there. That's not a straight line between those two bottom points. So I think this would actually, I think this would count. And maybe the strategy they want you to do is basically look at the five largest stars, or four of them, and a potential fifth, and just identify if you were to draw a straight line and then bend it in just a little bit, is there a star there that you could connect to to thus, you know, technically make those two large stars the tips of points. The other thing worth considering, now that I think about it as well, is those large stars technically don't need to be the tips of the five points of the star. So, I mean, I, I kind of have this a little bit memorized in my head, but what if we were to do something like this, right? Although that obviously wouldn't include the, the five stars. So if I were to do something like that and thus make one point here, that would go through that star. So that's problematic. If I did that, yeah, I still think when you really think about it, I technically have my four points made. And so where would my fifth point go? It would have to go like here. Yeah, I mean, I as, as you know, ugly as it is. Wait, no, this is not the same thing I made before. <laughs> this is not the same thing I made before. 
I'm missing my my lower point. Also, this is 20 pick rats. Why is this? <laughs> this is giving me some difficulty. Um, so the top left, I'm pretty sure, was similar. Um, it's making that bottom point. So I have that one up here, and that top left, and then the top right, and then the bottom right, and then the bottom left. I need to identify a, like, peak star. And I think it'll have to be this guy here. I think that will technically count as a five-pointed star. And it should connect the five largest stars, I think. Or maybe four of them? What's interesting is that there doesn't seem to be a fifth really large star. There really are only four of them. I'm, I'm curious to try it, I guess. Maybe it's that all of these like medium-sized stars count as like the second class. So it's like you have to use the four biggest stars, and then you can use one of the, the medium-sized stars. Let's let's give it a go. I think this is the best thing I'll come up with for now. There we go. <laughs> I'm afraid of getting it wrong though. And I got it wrong! Oh. You need to draw a big beautiful star. Connect five large objects in space. You know what? It's gonna be that they specifically say objects, not stars. Is there something else I can draw line to? Yeah, I don't know what this is, this tree. <laughs> or whatever this is I'm connecting to now, but <laughs> That must be what they're referring to. That must be what they're referring to. So let's... Let's try this. That goes through, unfortunately. Does this go through? No, it doesn't. Okay. So we can do something like... That, I guess? Is that it? I don't know why I'm able to connect to that thing on the bottom. It looks like a tree. <laughs> it looks like a tree. But I'm pretty sure there's a specific reason they use the, the word objects instead of star. Am I able to draw a line to like the house? No? Yeah, nothing else. So. I think this will be the biggest star we can we can create given the current conditions and it is technically a five-pointed star so connecting the five largest objects and there are those four large stars so I think this is what they want if not I'm missing something Luke, they here's want my answer but that's still not it frankly I'm ashamed. you need to draw a big beautiful star connect five large objects in space what am I missing? This is a 20 picker at puzzle. <laughs> this shouldn't be giving me that much difficulty. You know what? I bet they want me to draw the star while creating like the intersections. So they want me to do something like this. That's totally what they want me to do. Just look at the puzzle. It looks like it's designed to be solved this way. I think, I think I'm gonna stand my ground on this one and say, you can build a five pointed star, technically, right? Bigger than this if you don't have them intersect in the middle like that. And it would, st it would still technically be a five pointed star. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I yeah, may have go. actually had a better solution. Yeah, I'm gonna, 
critical I thinking think... is the key to success. Yeah, you need to connect the four stars to the Earth in order to form a star like the one shown here. It looks like people are still finding inspiration in the stars. Yeah, I think you can definitely make a bigger star. But regardless, we solved the puzzle. We, part of, you know, just answering test questions or solving puzzles is trying to get in the puzzle makers or the test writers head and figure out what they're asking, what they're aiming to, what they're, you know, what they designed the puzzle to test, what they want the, you know, the solver to look for and see. And I think that was what was really helpful in the end there. But regardless, hey, thanks a bunch. I can finally go home and catch a few winks. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, now I remember. Beatrice from the inn was the one to find Gerard's watch. Don't forget to ask her about it, okay? Okay, see you tomorrow. Come, Luke, let's go. Stuffed bear. Yeah, we'll give it to Layton. I'm sure he's got a soft side. Not that he seems particularly stern, right? But okay, so we have been stumped by the puzzled aliens puzzle. And we've solved quite a few other ones. We had a trouble. We had some trouble with that star one. Um, that I, I personally feel um, I may have found a better star for. But aside from that, we had some really cool puzzles. Um, I mean, even the star one was still really cool. I like that they treated Earth as an object in space, which makes a lot of sense. Um, it is pretty tricky. And yeah, we had a few really tough ones with the, the 50 Picarat puzzles. I really like the stamp one. That one was a lot of fun. And we've got plenty more to, you know, investigate, right? We have to chat with Beatrice, find out what's going on with this watch, so that we can get back and finally go to the cafe and see if Raymond is there. I'm pretty curious to see what's going on in this tower that seems so ominous. But, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Hope you guys weren't too frustrated with my attempts to solve some of uh, the puzzles, but are, are hanging in there and enjoying my thought processes and... Uh, you know, the characters we do run into along the way. But until the next episode, this is Moon Knight Zero, and this mission is complete.